There's a towering theme uh, in the scriptures uh, connected to uh, the growing of wheat, the threshing of wheat, the separating the wheat from the chaff. We've got it there in uh, Psalm 1. It talks about uh, the chaff, the wicked are like chaff, which the wind blows clean away. Well, that, that's from the threshing. Uh, which uh, takes place because we live in a very modern age. No one really knows what happens out in, in farms today, and it's all done with a combine harvester. And, uh, but it's the same principle that goes right back to early uh, biblical times, where you would have a threshing floor. And after the harvest, uh, the combine, as it were, which is everyone working hard, as it were, uh, out in the the field, bringing in the harvest. We were, um, uh, up till the industrial age, we all lived uh, on the basis of uh, seed time and harvest. And we had harvest Thanksgiving, we had Rogation Sunday. We were thankful to the Lord for his provision, for the seasons, for the, the, the rain and the sun. And uh, we have wonderful hymns from it. We plough the fields and scatter the good seed on the ground, but it is fed and watered by God's almighty hand. I want to focus on this issue of uh, the good seed and the good fruit that comes from good seed and how important it is to protect that seed across the whole cycle of uh, uh, planting through uh, to nurturing the saplings uh, through to the harvest. Now, <clears throat> in the Lord's parable in Matthew 13, the wheat and the tares, or the wheat and the weeds, which we've had on a previous God Day that you can search up on demand on the Revelation TV website, uh, we, we pointed out um, some of the aspects of, of that uh, parable. But one aspect that's very relevant to us today is uh, what happens uh, when uh, we allow the wheat and the weeds to grow and we wait patiently for the harvest and the enemy of the farmer doesn't play by the rules of the parable. So I'll give you an example. We're told as Christians we must be tolerant and, you know, we must allow the wheat and the tares to grow together. And I've, I've seen one particular uh, former evangelical uh, Baptist leader, you know, who you saw his grin um, endorsing so many books, but he uh, uh, departed from us. He, he was not one of us and he departed from us. He, he denied the the gospel story. He's still famous as a, a Christian sort of humanitarian worker, but um, he denied the essence of the gospel. Now, he's famous for, for saying, let the weeds, the wheat and the tares grow together. So we've swallowed that message as good, godly, tolerant Christians. And, um, you know, from the 1960s onwards, we thought, well, we can't judge you know, um, and so we, we should allow other lifestyles and not judge them, you know, because the Lord himself said, judge not so that you be not judged. And for by the measure you judge, you will be judged. Don't look for the, the, the speck in the eye of your brother when you've got a big beam in your own eye. Uh, uh, don't be unmerciful uh, to someone who owes you a little or who has wronged you in a little when we have wronged God in such, on such a scale and we've been forgiven much. Forgive us our, our debts as we forgive our debtors. It's a scriptural principle uh, which we all endorse. And uh, so we're, we don't come to this message, you know, with a haughty, um, uh, and uh, an arrogant uh, viewpoints. We want to uh, sort out, as it were, to sort out the wood from the trees and get in among the weeds and say, what has really happened since, you know, uh, all of these laws, which were based on Christian teaching, were 
disbanded in the 1960s. What's happened to the church? What's happened to the soul of our nation? What's happened to Christian teaching? What's happened to preaching? Forthright, forthright, fearless, bold teaching of God's word. It's been pretty well destroyed. Uh, the Christian landscape has been, has been totally corrupted. A and I, I believe that it's, this is the root of it, that while we've been told, not, don't touch the weeds, wait for the harvest. God is the Lord of the harvest and one day he will separate the wheat from the tares, the wheat from the weeds. The, the, he will do the threshing and separate the wheat from the chaff. It's not for us to judge. It's not for us to start pontificating on what the Bible says about what is righteous living. We, we all must just live together. Let's have a, a multicultural party. And um, it doesn't matter uh, what we're saying, um, like Boris Johnson's cabinet, to the wider world about how they should live, we can just have a party and it will all work out in the end. The problem with that uh, approach is that the enemy of the farmer, from the parable in uh, Matthew 13, is not playing by the rules. And so while we are being told to be tolerant and not to pull up the weeds and not to even judge the weeds, not to even say that they're weeds. In fact, we should call the weeds wheat. Let's call the tares um, wheat. And let's accept that they can call us um, or those who follow the narrow way, who follow God's law. Let's just take it on the chin when they redefine the wheat and call it weeds. And of course, Christianity is such an oppressive, you know, a repressive, you know, judgmental, um, law dictating religion. We all need to have a, 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 a the, the fresh wind of a, some Freudian utopia where, where we can all discover ourselves and get away from uh, sin and shame and, and guilt. Uh, and just all live this uh, sort of neutral, utopian, multicultural uh, lifestyle. Now, I have to just, now that I've mentioned multicultural, I have to just separate out, um, as I see it, uh, people living from different cultures to trying to mix and amalgamate um, different teachings and uh, different religions which are so distinct, which have different tenets, uh, which in some cases are diametrically opposed to each other. So a, a, a Christian who's faithful to God's word can't jettison the teachings of Jesus, uh, um, not least the teachings of Jesus about himself, about why he came uh, to earth. He didn't come just to be uh, among uh, a, a gallery, a, a hall of fame of, of great religious leaders. He came as the Son of God to die on the cross for the sins of the world, to rescue those who are in sin, um, to offer forgiveness for those who are in sin so that they could be restored uh, to uh, the fulfillment that God intended through creating us, that we would be fulfilled and free from the curse of sin and death. That's the Christian teaching. And he said, look, no man comes to the Father. No one gets to God. No one can get to heaven by themselves or by any other way except through me, except through accepting my message. So while we can live alongside people who uh, uh, ascribe, subscribe to a, a different creed. We, we can't mix the creeds and suggest that they're all equal when Jesus himself made exclusive truth claims, exclusive meaning that they are to the exclusion of all other um, truth claims. Uh, by the way, many uh, of, of the, the, the religious leaders um, through history who are uh, searching for the truth, 
Uh, many of them were humble enough not to say, I am the way. Um, and Jesus was very humble. He humbled himself, um, took on the form of humanity and became obedient unto death. Uh, the Lord was humble, Philippians 2. Um, but he was also truthful and he said, I am the way. I am the way, not a way. Um, as Obama said, oh yes, um, Jesus is, is, is the way for me, which is a sort of hidden way of saying there are many ways to God, but Jesus didn't give Obama or you or me or any other option. So if we're gonna be faithful to his word, we have to say he is the way. How do we deal with it? Do we deal with it by saying, oh yes, we um, are like Jesus and we are superior to others and those who are outside of the Christian faith are infidels. No, we are all sinners saved by, saved by grace. Uh, and we, we have to uh, be compassionate um, and open. And by the way, we have to plead with others to be reconciled to God, to know uh, his peace in their hearts, to know uh, forgiveness through the Lord Jesus. Now, that's different uh, from what I would call a kind of um, living together, a multiculturalism. Uh, uh, in other words, we de facto in the UK, we live with many different cultures. But there's one that seems to be, well, there's probably two actually, that, that seem to be becoming more um, uh, prevalent and more menacing. And I want to single out the, the philosophy, the, the utopian progressive liberal, liberalism that says, look, we've got to suppress Christianity. We've got to pull up the wheat of Christianity. We've got to dig it up from the roots. We've got to discard it as though it is chaff. We're, you know, going onwards and upwards into this utopia of a, a, a new Britannia, uh, and we, do, we can dispense with all of this medieval uh, rubbish from the Judeo-Christian past. This is what I'm standing against. And so coming back to this theme of us waiting for the harvest, yes, we should wait for the harvest. And of course, the Lord of the harvest will separate the wheat from the tares. But should we allow the wheat to be uh, redefined as weeds? Should we allow sin to be redefined as virtuous? Um, should, should we allow the Christian teachings, the foundational Christian teachings based on the law of Moses uh, that distinguishes between right and wrong, um, should we just uh, allow that to be inverted? And as Isaiah said in, in the fifth chapter of Isaiah, woe to those who call evil good, who call darkness light, light darkness. We're living in an age with the social media where people think that because they say something or because they write something or because they attribute it to another person who said something or written something, it's true. That isn't truth. Go back to Francis Bacon and his great essay of truth, which starts with Pilate. What is truth? Said jesting Pilate, and then went away before waiting for the answer. This is our world today. It's all capture the moment with a falsehood, with an alternative fact, with clickbait, with, uh, um, anything that dazzles with something that's seductive, enticing, titillating. It doesn't matter whether or not it's true because you can move on. The news agenda moves on so we don't have to be accountable for what we said or written. Um, all we need to do is follow the rules of journalism which says, well, you must attribute uh, what you, you say or, or broadcast with a quotation from someone on the ground. Well, how easy is it to manipulate when the person on the ground is lying through his teeth and making claims, whether, it, whether it's about casualties or whether it's about civilians or whether they're combatants um, or, or who's, who's the 
aggressor. Let's talk about the, the Israel-Gaza Gaza war and use statistics to say, well, the other side is trying to build a greater Israel. And then you look into the scale of, of little Israel in the Middle East and, and you think, really, when they're 200 times smaller than the land mass of, of the hostile nations around, you go back over the last 80 or years, this narrative has been pushed time and time again, inversion of the truth, maligning of the motives of, of one side. Uh, and they think they've got away with it. Well, ultimately, uh, truth will prevail because truth is something that's, that uh, can be proved, ultimately. Uh, of course, in, in a world of subterfuge and, you know, and the truth being subverted uh, uh, and lies traveling around the world before the truth gets its boot on and truth being the first casualty of war, you think, oh, well, it will never come out. Uh, but it does come out. The Nazis um, thought they had hidden their crimes. They thought they could uh, uh, incinerate all of those terrible, um, wretched victims of the Holocaust. But bit by bit, the evidence of the, the, the shoes that have been discarded, the, the glasses that have been taken, the teeth that have been taken out. Uh, Babi Yar with 30,000 um, shot in that, that ditch outside Kiev, layer upon layer upon layer upon layer, unearthed. Um, the massacre of, of Srebrenica. These uh, um, grisly facts the evidence comes out. And, you know, we had the Nuremberg trials. Okay, all the evidence didn't come out. And this is the point, that one day, one day justice will prevail because the Christian teaching is that we're accountable not to the world's media, not to those who can be manipulated and deceived, um, not to kangaroo courts or show trials, we're going to be accountable to a righteous God, a God of justice, who will have, the books will be opened. And one day we will all stand before the ultimate righteous judge. And people say, oh, well, that's, that's the future. You know, there can't be proof that that's going to happen. Uh, what I would say is it's, it's something that has a great bearing on how we live today. How should we live today in the light of those promises and warnings of God's word, in the light of the conscience that he's put within us? Some folks say, or quite rightly, you, your conscience can be dulled, it can be seared, you can seal off your conscience, you, you commit one murder, you're, you're, you're pretty conscious of what you've done. Uh, you commit multiple murders, eventually you, you don't see a right from wrong. But that is a tragedy because we, a conscience is a great gift. Now as a nation uh, and as a Western world, we've decided to suppress the conscience, to suppress guilt and shame, to suppress the, the Ten Commandments that God gave us so that we'd be it clearly defined before us what is right and wrong and and all of the um, uh, commands that spread uh, from from those they're clearly spoken is it so that we could all uh, uh, be in our own strength righteous pharisees that we could um, as it were march through the gates of heaven with our heads held high and saying, we've achieved it, and uh, look at all of those you know, poor blighters and plebs who, who haven't made it because they didn't have the same righteous talents that we have. No, it's not for that, and that's not the Christian message. But the, um, what responsibility do, do we have now then? If, if God is the one who's brought about our salvation through the Lord Jesus, what obligation is there? Um, as uh, Christians. By the way, we're, we're not the, the first generation of Christians. We are whatever, the umpteenth. 
the 100th uh, generation. What should we do? We're, we're, we're not supposed to pull up uh, the weeds and the tears. I would say the least we can do, <clears throat> in all humility, aware of all of our failings and of God's grace in our lives, amazing grace that saved a wretch like me, we should identify with John Newton, but we have to say that sin is sin. And what is the definition of sin? People don't want to hear it. They, 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 they say we don't do God. They clasp their hands on, on their ears. They run a mile from uh, those stubborn Christians who keep saying, but sin is sin. It's wrong. It's displeasing to God. It's dysfunctional. It's not how we were created to be. You know, um, one man and one woman are nurturing and bringing up children. This is the model that goes right back to the beginning. And the Lord Jesus in Matthew 19 himself, he refers to it, um, uh, this model of one man and one woman. So anything outside that model is wrong. Adultery is wrong. It's sinful. But Romans 2 says, um, you who boast about the law, you who say that uh, people um, should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? So the conscience there is bearing witness. Um, Paul is not saying that, oh, well, 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 everyone commits adultery, everyone does wrong, you who pass judgment on someone else, you're condemning yourself because you do the same things. Um, he's not saying that we take away the standard. Um, uh, but what he's saying is he's shining a light on the hypocrisy of us all. When we say, you shouldn't do that, I'm a guide for the blind, and yet I'm walking in, in darkness, willfully walking in darkness. I, I find that uh, Romans uh, 2 is, is m more powerful than Romans 1, which everyone gets all heated about. Um, uh, those who, um, who turn away from God and turn towards a depraved mind and a senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless, and encourage people to do wrong and effectively say wrong is right, coming back to Isaiah 5. Now, Romans 2 is, is powerful because Paul takes a, a breath after condemning the, the corruption of a pagan world, of, of a, a godless uh, world, and uh, of children disobeying parents, of, of a chaotic world. He takes a step back and says, you, therefore, have no excuse. Tim, whoever you are watching this God day, you um, have no excuse because you who pass judgment do the same things. Don't you know that those who pass judgment uh, and yet do the same things um, uh, will come under God's judgment? But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you're storing up wrath against yourself uh, on the, for the day of God's judgments. Uh, and, and then further along, it talks about conscience and it talks about your conscience bearing witness. And he says, this will take place on the day when God will judge men's secrets through Jesus Christ as my uh, gospel declares. What's, what's the lesson of the wheat and the tares that I'm trying to bring out in, in, this, in this talk? It is that we have no mandate to stand by and do nothing, to stand by and be silent when uh, in the public square, uh, Jesus is being mocked. Um, Jesus who saved, who died for the sins of the world is being mocked and his name being trampled on the foot. We have to uh, stand up and say something about it. If we see um, the clear definitions of right and wrong being uh, at worst inverted or by some trickery or smoke and mirrors uh, muddied so that people, uh, and ch especially children, can't see what is right and wrong, and worse still, they're encouraged to do wrong, uh, to misidentify themselves and to misidentify others. We have to speak out. When we see a bullying state um, oppressing uh, people, 
uh, oppressing them in, in schools, oppressing good, godly, righteous teachers who stand up and say what's right and wrong and they're, they're shunted out of their profession, or doctors who say, actually, um, you, there's, there's, a, there's a way where you can be relieved from all of your stresses and your anxiety and your mental torment uh, uh, and your sin if you pray to God, uh, they're being hounded out of the profession. And sadly, even in church, if you were to say, some churches, if you were to say uh, some of what I'm saying in this very simple, classical Christian uh, teaching, uh, you, you'd, be, you'd be defrocked, you'd be hounded out, you'd be called, you know, you, you'd be told that you're not a Christian, that this is not Christian language, and yet it's the heart of, of love is to speak the truth. Speak the truth in love. Uh, and of course we're going to be uh, mischaracterized, we're going to be accused of being hateful, we're going to be accused of being unloving, but in the long run, and the, in, in the eternal long run, we've done our duty, we've spoken out when we've seen wrongdoing, when we've seen injustice, when we uh, witness a wrong teaching in the church and in society, uh, from the modern progressive liberal Pharisees of our time who say we are the righteous one, uh, ones, um, don't pollute the minds of children with talk about creation, um, belief in creation and teaching creation to children is like denying the Holocaust. Everything is being muddied and murkied. Let's, let's go back to uh, the sword of truth, the tower of truth spoken in, in Francis Bacon's uh, beautiful essay of truth. Look it up and, and read it. Uh, even though there are going to be, there's going to be pain and suffering and it's hard to, to live alongside the tears. Just stand tall and wait for the harvest. The Lord of the harvest will come on time. Uh, we don't need to fret. We just need to look up and be faithful and be found the faithful and wise servant who, when his master returns, uh, sees him doing the business that he was requested to do. That's what the Lord's asked us to do, to be um, his uh, light in these days, to be salt, to be a bit of an irritant in the society that rejects his teaching, but stand tall and the next generation of future generations will thank you for it. We're here for eternity. We're here for the long haul. And one day the wheat will be separated from the chaff by God's grace and that we will be brought in, as it were, as part of the harvest for his glory. Thanks for listening. Thank you.